Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alexia Lambrakaki, and I'm the events coordinator of the University of Sussex Scientific Society. Um, this evening, we are delighted to be hosting Professor Nick Lane, along with our um, co-host, uh, the Sussex Biochemistry Society. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alexia Lambrakaki. I'm sorry. Um, and um, we are hosting a pioneering biochemist and world-renowned scientific writer, um, Nick Lane, which is a founding member of the UCL Consortium, I'm sorry, for mitochondrial research and the co-director of the UCL Center for Life's Origin and Evolution. Uh, his academic and literary work exploring the origins of life has served an invaluable contributions to our understanding. He has published several books, including Life Ascending, uh, The Ten Great Inventions of Evolution, and The Vital Question, uh, dubbed as a must read by Bill Gates. He has won numerous awards, including the Michael Faraday Prize, and we are thrilled he's joining us this evening. Um, my co-host for tonight's event is Mari Mortaza, the president of the society. And before I hand over to him, I'd like to say, Nick, welcome to the Scientific Society. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, Nick. Uh, so I guess I'll start with the question uh, that we seem to be asking everyone. How has the, the last year been for you with COVID? Uh, pretty tough, hasn't it? Um, Surprisingly so. I mean, I, I kind of rather hoped that it would be more relaxing, but it hasn't been at all. It's been just as intense as ever, but without the social interactions. And it's made me realise, I think, that I'm not maybe the most social of people, but um, I, I, I've, I've missed social interactions enormously. Um, just, just going down the pub, just talking to people, just being with my, my group, just mixing with students after lectures. Like, you know, all of this makes life fun. Um, and, and it's, it's been taken away. So it's not, been a, it's not been an easy year for anybody. I haven't lost anybody. I've not been ill. I mean, in, I, I've had it easy compared to most people. And how has it been as a, I guess, as a lecturer? Because we're, we're students, we sort of understand it from our side of things, but it's not often we get to speak to someone that does the teaching as well. <laughs> um, I think, I, I suppose you, you, you all know that most lecturers are not spending their whole time lecturing anyway. We're doing research most of the time or a lot of the time. So we care a lot about lecturing, but I would say uh, uh, the, the overall standard of lecturing in universities is probably lower than you, most of you would remember from schools, I, I would suspect. I mean, I, I think, you know, I have never had any formal training as a lecturer uh, in a serious way, at least. I think I do a decent job, I'd like to think that. Um, I, I think you can you can try and fire people up with, the enthusiasm of the lab of research of being at the at the coal face and so on it's a lot harder to do all of that online and most of us don't really have much background at doing these things online and so we have found out along the way as well um and i guess we're doing it better now than than we were as as a kind of a group certainly i am um from last september or or, or whenever um but it's been it's been quite a steep learning experience for me you mentioned um, research just then. So uh, what have you been up to with uh, regard to that? Uh, well, that was closed down completely for about three or four months uh, in the first lockdown. And then it opened up in a socially distanced kind of way in the summer. Uh, and the labs have been open since then. Uh, but it's very difficult to have a, a normal lab meeting. So there's about eight people in my group. And, you know, it's nice. What we would normally do is, is have a, a, a two hour sit around a table, discuss everything and then go to the pub for lunch afterwards. That's the normal way of having a lab meeting. Uh, and, and all that's gone. You know, you end up with a with a with a Zoom meeting, which is which is surprisingly good. But, you know, it misses the pub at the end of it. We, we tried having a glass of wine at the end of it, but it didn't really work so well. It's not quite the same. Uh, I know Alexia has got some questions for you uh, yeah. about your career, so I'll pass over to her. Thank you, Marty. Um, so uh, what we've seen from uh, your career, uh, we can see that you start off studying kidney transplants, but <laughs> you decided to move away from that. What happened there? Uh, I've, I've had a bit of a, a weird path, really. I'm not sure I can recommend it to anybody, um, although I'd like to. I wish I could. Um, so 
specifically that was my PhD was to do with kidney transplants, and it was actually on on um, mitochondrial function and how cells deal with oxygen. Mm -hmm. So mitochondria are the powerhouses of cells. I don't know how many people will be. I'll, I'll try and avoid using using difficult terms, but. Um, that's something essentially it's 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 about how, how how cells and organs deal with oxygen and when you have a kidney transplant or a liver transplant or anything effectively you you cut them off from oxygen for the period that you store them you take them out of the body you put it in a, in a bucket on ice and, and it doesn't have any oxygen then you plug it in again you reintroduce the oxygen and at that point it probably goes wrong now whether it goes wrong or not depends on just how long it's been sitting in a in a bucket of ice yeah um and if it's been for a kidney one day, then it's going to work fine. But if it's been two days or maybe three days, it's not going to work at all. And very often you, you, you need to find the right person. You need to do an immunological match so that you can make sure that they don't reject the kidney on the table. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it can take it, you know, it can take a day or two to do that and to get someone to come to the right hospital. And, and so to be able to preserve organs for a longer period is a really important thing to be able to do. And, and when I was doing my PhD on this, antioxidants were all the rage. And the idea was, well, the problem with reintroducing oxygen is you get what are called oxygen-free radicals that most people probably will have heard of. And they just kind of cause havoc and, and, and yeah. destroy the, the tissue. Mm -hmm. and so throw in some antioxidants at a, a high dose and it should prevent all that from happening. And then the kidneys will work just fine and everything will be, will be great. It never worked. Never yeah. worked. Uh, <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> I imagine. Yeah. You there. <laughs> I, I mean, we. I, I suppose what I succeeded in doing was demonstrating that there really was a problem. <laughs> um, which <laughs> is kind of deal. futile. That's why you decided to move to move away into something different. Yes, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I, I couldn't bear doing it any longer. So I was really interested in the chemistry and the biology underlying it. Medicine um, can be disappointing. I'm 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 very sorry to admit. Yes, I I, was, I mean I think if, if you you know try and try and try again, but at some point, um, you you know if it's not working, you have to think. Well, what, what, I've, I've got to what do something else. Do? Yes. Yeah. So I don't imagine that still interests you, or do you still follow the latest kidney? transplant news i don't follow it closely but i am aware of it i do talk oh. to people about it okay um and it's not i mean this the, one of the wonderful things about science is it's not a million miles away from what i do now mm -hmm. um which may sound mad because what i work on mostly now is the origin of life yeah um but but there's a link there's a link uh, mm -hmm. and the link is in well not in oxygen but in energy in energy flow so mm -hmm. what we're using oxygen for is in generating energy and we do it across a membrane. We charge a membrane. So we have an electrical charge on a membrane, which has the same power as a bolt of lightning. Mm -hmm. so this is in, inside our cells. We've got all these mitochondrial membranes. I sometimes say if you, if you were to stretch them all out, they would, they would, your mitochondrial membranes would be about four football pitches worth of membrane. And the charge on it, if you shrank down to the size of a molecule, the charge... It would be equivalent to to a bolt of lightning, thirty million volts per meter. It's yeah. across a, it's, it's it's six millionths of a millimeter in diameter. The the membrane, so it's a it's a it's a really high charge across a really small distance. But if you were that size, the the, the charge you would feel uh, is like a bolt of lightning, and that's what's driving everything. And mm -hmm. that's what you wonder about with the origin of life. How does that kind of charge come about, and does it always drive everything? Mm, the answer that's is that there is a link there i guess i mean i can uh, see it myself um moving away from the kidney transplant area um i've read that you won uh, the writing prize i wanted to go into the scientific writing uh in this bit um yes so i read that you won a writing prize during your phd um so what it is about scientific writing or writing in general that slowly became an interest to you how did it how did it start what interests you most um i, I always liked writing um and and i said i when i was at school i was 
I had ambitions to be a writer, but not not very serious ambitions, but they were things. And I felt I could, you know, sometimes the, the biology teacher would read out one of my answers, a paragraph from here or there and say, oh, this is, this is beautifully put," and I was very proud. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but then I kind of put it all to one side. When I finished my degree, I, I, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll become a writer. So I wrote to New Scientist at that point and said, uh, have you got any jobs for writers? And, and they, they wrote back to me, which was nice of them, and, and laughed more or less and said, uh, well, if you want to come to New Scientist, you need some experience. Or you need to get some experience in, in uh, you know, proper scientific journals um you know find find some journals doing hardcore science learn your trade there and then come back to us in five years so i just kind, kind of, of like <laughs> medical journalism you would say no i don't think so i think they actually had in mind um scientific journals oh. just editing uh, mm-hmm. science mm-hmm. papers and things so it sounded awful that. yes okay so so, so i i ran away <laughs> <laughs> you ran away okay um i understand that you did that for a couple of years um no well that was that was that was when i first thought about writing so then yeah, I, yeah. i did a phd and and during the phd i was encouraged to enter a writing competition i hadn't even thought of it actually mm-hmm. and so i did and rather unexpectedly did well um and and so then when i'd finished the phd and i, I you know I was, i was thinking I can't go on doing kidney transplants that don't work. What am I going to do? So I was looking in the back of New Scientist for, um, I'm not advertising New Scientist here, it just, just happened to be. Um, I, I, I was looking for postdoc jobs to do with free radical chemistry, but nothing to do with organ transplants, but drawing on my background, or writing jobs because I'd won this writing competition. So I thought, well, maybe I could write. So I, 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 had, I had a few interviews for writing jobs before I got anything for as a postdoc position. Um, and they were mostly awful. They were mostly for pharmaceutical companies, um, effectively writing up clinical trials reports. I had no idea that such a career existed. Um, so it would be like writing a PhD thesis all your life on someone else's work, just three, 400 page reports of a, of a clinical trial. Um, you know, someone has to do it. It's actually an important thing to do and it has to be readable and it has to communicate, but it, 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 not, it didn't capture my imagination, let's say. The yeah. very last one I had before I was thought I'm not going to apply for any more writing jobs at all was for a company that did animations, 3D animations of how drugs work. Um, That's rather pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drugs, these are. Uh, and... Um, And so it'll be, it, would, it, would, it might be aimed at patients or it might be aimed at doctors or it might be aimed at, you know, at GPs or specialists or something. Um, and, and the idea was, okay, we've got a new, a, a new treatment for Alzheimer's disease. We want a 12-minute video, which is going to say, here's how Alzheimer's disease works. These, these are what we think goes wrong. And here's, here's our new drug and here's what it does. And, 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 and really, you should, you should think about buying it. That's basically how these things work. It's, it's basically soft marketing for the pharmaceutical industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was also quite creative and quite interesting. And it was basically scientific because it was all based on, you know, solid scientific research. What really attracted me to it was the idea that you could um, have a camera angle. You're going to zoom into the brain and you come down into a synapse and you, you know, you, you, you all the things that you imagine from cartoons, you can, you can be the director of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was great fun. And I learned a lot about writing that way. Uh, things I would never have expected to learn. So mm-hmm. one of them was um, if you're following it on a camera, one thing leads to the next thing, which leads to the next thing. You can't write as you, you might in a scientific paper where you, 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 you keep, bringing a discussion around on itself. No, you've got a forward direction that you've got to go in. Uh, so it's very causal. Mm-hmm. On th- okay. This leads to that, leads to that. And, and, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing to learn. It's very, I find it very hard to get used to doing that because it's, it's kind of an overclaim for science. Yeah. And the other thing was writing plain English, taking myself out of it um, and, and trying to write international English for an audience uh, of mostly of people who, who can understand but but are not you know not speaking English as a first language and not necessarily going to follow colloquial English so you cut out all the nonsense and the 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 poetry and the plain mm-hmm. and that was hard for me as well and really helped me a lot 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mentioned causality. So after your job at uh, the scientific animation company, um, what was the bridge between that and starting to do more intensive scientific research into writing your first book? Um, well, when I when I was writing the first book, essentially the the, the problem with this medical communications uh, was it was always it was always a hopping to the tune of the client, if you like. Uh, it would be a pharmaceutical company would say we have a product. Uh, for Alzheimer's disease, or next week it might be for rheumatoid arthritis, or the week after that it might be for strokes, or it might be for pain. So in some way, it was, it was extremely interesting learning about all these different fields week after week after week. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd have to deliver something by Tuesday next week, and it would have to be good. Uh, so mm -hmm. it was pretty intense and stressful. Um, and what I, the other thing I learned was that free radicals seemed to be related to just about everything that I was... So, so it wasn't as difficult to learn about other areas of medicine as I would have expected it to be. Um, but the, the problem with it was that it, you, you, you never had the time to do anything as well as you wanted to, and you never had the time to put things together and think, well, how does all this fit together? Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, if maybe, I, maybe I can write a book on it. And, and because I kept finding free radicals were important in everything, uh, and because my PhD had been on them, then I thought, well, maybe a book on oxygen and medicine and free radicals would, would kind of take or, me out of that loop. Uh, it took me a long time to get a contract, as you can imagine, because I was completely unknown. Um, and I, I got a contract in the end for Oxford University Press. It took about two and a half years after I started talking to them before they finally gave me a piece of paper that said, go and write a book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the book just became something completely different to what I'd imagined, to what I'd proposed to them. Because I, I, I thought, well, where does all the oxygen come from? I didn't really know. Um, you know, I know it comes from photosynthesis. So <laughs> th did it come from trees? Does it come from cyanobacteria? When you did it go into depth in the atmosphere? Yeah. It was fantastic. So I found a whole area of science that I knew nothing at all about. How can we know what the composition of the air was three billion years ago? It's just a wonderful question. Um, and we can with the, with quite a few uh, provisos, but but still. So I became very uh, caught up in geology and the history of the planet and the history of life and paleontology and 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 and, and it kind of melded with the medicine side of things. And and I, I suppose that's now become more or less what I write books about. But it 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 happened kind of by chance, really by chance okay that is so interesting so um i know that after your first book you wrote uh another three books but then uh along the way you returned to academia what how did that happen why did you uh, decide to return there again um writing books is wonderful it's pretty lonely when i finished the first book on oxygen um I was invited to the Hay Festival and I thought, wow, you know, all these famous people at the Hay Festival and there's me. Um, and I, I went there and, and, and there were a queue of about 200 people around this tent waiting for me to give a talk on oxygen. And I realized I hadn't actually said anything to anybody for about a year at that point. I'd just been in a room writing a book and I had I'd almost forgotten how to speak. Um, so I had a kind of a panic attack and it was all right, but it, it, oh. uh, it made me realize that there's a, there's a whole that writing is, is a lonely endeavor, really. Um, and you, you interact with people mostly by email, I was doing in those days. You know, I email people around the world to check up on facts and make sure I got things right. Gradually, I, I came to put more and more of my own thinking and my own ideas into them as I became more confident about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you get to the point where you know, you can, you, can, you can bring almost a scientific method to bear on what we already know, which is to say, you can, you can say, well, if, if this is linked to that in this way, then this should be true as well, and that should be true. And in science, you go and test the hypothesis in the lab, but maybe other people have done it already. So you can test the literature by saying, well, if this is true and that's true, then that should be true. So has anyone done it? Mm -hmm. So you go and find out if anyone's done it. And if someone has done something similar, then you talk to them or email them and ask them specific questions. And so my writing was becoming more and more focused on how things might actually be. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you get to the point where 
you, 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 you know, people run out of answers. Mm -hmm. It's not there in the literature. It's simply you ask these questions and you don't know what the answer is. Nobody knows what the answer is. And you realize there's a hole here. There's an enormous hole in the middle of biology where people don't know what the answers to these questions are. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do about it? Well, either you go back to the lab, you go back into academia, or you give up really because you can't, mm. you can't do any more than that. And you can't persuade anybody else to go and do it for you because it's not their question. People mm. are very right. interested in what they're doing themselves and not necessarily in what you want them to do, which is very understandable. Exactly. All right. I see then. Okay. I understand completely. So uh, now I'm just going to switch over to Mari who has some questions about uh, journalism and a little bit more writing. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Alexia. Actually, I, if I could just change tack slightly, I was going to ask a few questions on that, but you know, you've just mentioned um, you're going into the, a field where you may not necessarily have all the answers laid out in front of you. So I thought I'd maybe touch on the origin of life, uh, if you don't mind. And I suppose my question was that, I guess my question is a bit broad in that, you know, I, I was doing a bit of reading before this, trying to find the, the various prevailing <laughs> theories throughout history of, of how life uh, began whether it's it's the church's view uh, or religious views of it being divine providence or the astronomer Fred Hoyle suggesting that it derived from somewhere else or Charles Darwin um, coming up with the primordial type of soup in a pond uh, mm -hmm. with the perfect ingredients a very sort of Miller Ure esque um, but you as I understand believe it to be slightly different um, more to do with the ocean rather than outer space so I thought if you wouldn't mind, if you could just talk us through your idea, so how you think, in a nutshell, uh, life began. Um, okay, so so there's a way in for me, um, and and that brings my my whole scientific background to the question, if you like, which everybody is going to do, um, and I have one advantage, which is the word energy, because energy has to be important to life. So to some extent. I cannot be completely wrong. I think energy is important and I can't be completely wrong about that. So <laughs> you kind of take a big step back and, and think, okay, so how does energy work in cells? Well, it works, as I said before, with this electrical charge on a membrane, like a bolt of lightning. Where does that come from? The weird thing is all life works that way. Um, all bacteria have got a charge on their membrane. There's another group that look like bacteria called archaea. They're, they're quite different in their genetics. Um, they've got exactly the same charge on their membrane. We have the same charge in all our mitochondria. You use that charge for photosynthesis. You use it for respiration. You use it basically for everything. You use it for motoring around. The bacterial flagellum is a kind of a, 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 a pump which, which, which rotates um, like a corkscrew and, and, and drives the bacteria around. It's, it's powered by this same charge. So it's, it's universal across life. And the question is, well, how could it possibly have arisen? And, and it's not the, not the kind of question you can easily answer. Until I came across in writing books, a guy called Mike Russell, who was talking about a type of deep sea hydrothermal vent, where you have effectively cell-like pores in the rock. So an, a, a, a labyrinth of interconnected micropores with cell-like structures containing iron sulfide minerals which are very similar to the iron sulfur proteins that we have in our own cells today. Um, and the thing that really captured my imagination was that the oceans were acidic in those days, and so the acid water would percolate into these vents, and the fluids were alkaline, so you'd have alkaline hydrothermal fluids percolating through, and then you could have steep differences in, in acidity between one side of a barrier and the other side of a barrier. And that gives you the same kind of charge on the membrane, on the barrier that you have in a membrane. So it's a, it's a completely geological system, which is amazingly similar to how a cell works. So it's a very beguiling idea. And it doesn't mean it's true. It's just that it's, it might be true. And everything I've done since then, I, I was lucky to get back into science, but a lot of the time I've been thinking about that and trying to do experiments along those lines and so on. And, and it's become, I would say, more true rather than less true. The, 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 the experiments we've done and other people have done make it look more and more plausible that life started that way. That's not to say it did or that I'm right. It's just that it's, it seems more plausible rather than less plausible compared to 10 years ago. Um, it's really thrilling to work on questions like the origin of life. I mean, it's, it's hard to kind of convey just the, the, the fun 
being allowed to do this. Yeah. Okay. I expect at some point someone's going to come in and say, you're not allowed to do this anymore. <laughs> you don't grow up and get a proper job. It's a wonderful thing to be allowed to work on it and to think about it and to write books about it. It's, um, I, I don't expect it to last. I don't know. I would like to say, uh, I hope it'll last a few more years, but who knows what, what life has in store. Gosh, it's so interesting to hear you saying that. And I suppose it is, it, it, it stands that with the, these really big concepts, whether it be the origin of life, whether there's extraterrestrial life, origin of the universe, these are the sort of topics that the public and people in general really, I think, engage with. Before yes. I move on to my next question, uh, sorry, yeah. I will just say that um, to those of you who are watching in the audience, um, I, we should have said this earlier, sorry for not doing this, but if you do have any questions for Nick, um, you can put them in the chat uh, box and we'll do our best to uh, get to them. But I, I suppose to, to follow up from that, I wanted to ask uh, about uh, another, another speaker that we actually had here at the Society uh, a few weeks ago, a gentleman by the name of Avi Loeb, who's an oh, yes. astronomer. At, oh, you're familiar with him? I, I'm, I've never met him, though I'm supposed to be debating him, actually, in, in, a, in a philosophical festival in, at the end of May, I think. I don't remember I how the light gets in is, is the, is the <laughs> festival, and I'm supposed to be having, well, debate may be too strong a word, but a discussion anyway about uh, the origin of life, I suppose. I think in that case, it's all panspermia, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think you'll perhaps un un understand where my, what my question would be then, which is that, you know, he believes that it's not just possible, but in fact, very likely that there is complex, intelligent life um, throughout the universe, that the idea that we're not the only kids on the block, and it would be, um, I think in his words, slightly arrogant to believe otherwise. But, you know, do you, I know in the past you've said that you, you know, you think there may be life um, in other, on other planets, but perhaps not complex life. To, to Arby's idea, um, if you could give us a bit of a sneak preview of the points yes. of the discussion, uh, do you um, think there's any truth to it? Uh, well, there could be, but um, I doubt it. Um, the, so, so it seems to me that the origin of life is highly likely with some provisos about that, but... It seems to me the conditions on wet, rocky planets like the Earth, but there are literally billions of wet, rocky exoplanets that we can it, it, have either detected or extrapolated to be there in the Milky Way alone. Um, so I see no reason from everything I do why you would not have bacterial level of life on a lot of those planets. It would be disappointing if it wasn't. And, and, and I would hope that places, you know, moons in our own solar system, like Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn, um, it's a perfectly feasible place for life to have started, at least at the level of bacteria. But we have to look at life on Earth and think, you know, we, we don't know what's out there. And the tendency is to argue statistically and say, well, there's an awful lot of stuff out there and the chances of you not having life out there must be so remote that there must be life out there and therefore it's only a matter of time before we find it, even though it's an awful long way away. That's the kind of the statistical argument that there's going to be life out there compressed into a silly nutshell. Um, what I tend to do is think the other way around and think, well, life on Earth has had a very weird pattern so you have bacteria, and, and they're still bacteria. They haven't changed. We see fossils of bacteria from about 4 billion years ago, and we see them now, and they're, they're tiny little things. Um, and and there's nothing much going on inside in terms of their morphology that you could see down in an electron microscope. I'm generalizing badly here, but compared to an amoeba, they're amazingly simple. Uh, and amoebas, and, and you know, our kind of cell with a nucleus, um, we, we all share the same structures and a lot of them. So if you look at a plant cell down a microscope and an animal cell and a fungal cell, they all basically have the same structures. And, uh, you know, page after page after page in a textbook are the same structures. And bacteria don't have any of them. So there's a, a, a valid and interesting question. Well, sorry, the light is shining quite brightly here. Um, why... Why, why, why don't bacteria evolve complexity? Because they haven't on Earth. And all the complex life that we see on Earth is, has got all the same stuff going on inside it. So it shares a common ancestor. And by definition, that common ancestor must have arisen once. Otherwise, it's not a common ancestor. So at a, at a bare face level, um, simple life gets stuck in a rut and complex life is rare and improbable. 
And then the question is, why do we know anything? Do we have any principles that can explain why that would be? And, and this is really one of the themes of, uh, well, the, um, the vital question as a book. Um, I think it comes down to a, a symbiosis where one cell gets inside another one, which is pretty unlikely. The cell that gets inside becomes the mitochondria, the powerhouses of our cells. You have a kind of a genetic you have so the, the genes in the mitochondria, which we still have, get whittled down to only those that you need for respiration. That allows you to have effectively multiple multibacterial power without all the overheads that bacteria have to make all the rest of their genes and all the rest of the proteins. And that allows us to expand our nuclear genome up to a massive scale, 100,000 times larger than bacterial genomes, at least in terms of DNA content. And so it, ch it changes everything about what evolution can do. And so the question is, how rare and unlikely is that event? And it's very, very, very difficult to put a number on that. Uh, it happened yeah. once here. It might have happened hundreds of times here, but they all disappeared on every other occasion. So then the question would be, why did they disappear on every other occasion? Was it predictable that they would disappear or was it just bad luck? Um, I would say it was predictable that they would disappear because it's, you know, you, you've also got two organisms living for an extended period of time in really intimate contact with each other, one inside the other one. The chances of it going wrong is really high. So, mm -hmm. so maybe if you extrapolate this, what are the what are the chances that bacteria on other planets would operate the same way? Would they also have this electrical charge on their membranes? Would they also be cells? Would they also be made of carbon? So you can begin to deconstruct the question. And you know, carbon is very common. Carbon dioxide is in all these planetary atmospheres. There's a strong argument to say statistically life is probably going to be a bit similar to here if you found it on other planets. That yeah. Carbon just does its job so well and all these other constraints push you in the same direction and end up saying that we're going to have a problem with complex life anywhere. It doesn't mean it's not yeah. going to happen. It just means that it's, it's not kind of inevitably destined to happen. Yeah, I think you, you talk about this really um, brilliantly in, in your books. And one of the ones that I enjoyed especially was The Vital Question. But I wasn't the only fan of that. Uh, Bill Gates is uh, quite <laughs> a big fan of it, as I understand. So I suppose um, because I saw a video that you made that ended up on his YouTube channel. Um, so I suppose, did you, how did you find out about that, that he was such a, a big fan and thought your book was a must read? Uh, well, he emailed me. Well, not him. His, his, someone from his office emailed me. Uh, Trevor Mundell, who's now the head of the Gates Foundation, um, wow. and, uh, and, and, and said that, um, that Bill Gates is, uh, well, he actually mentioned a paper, a specific paper rather than the book initially. And I, I, this had gone to a junk folder, and I kind of found it by almost chance. And, um, and then I thought, well, it is, this can't be real. <laughs> well, it turned out it was real. I answered, I answered the called um because they, they said call, call back on this number which already sounds suspicious doesn't it anyway i i, I called them back um and it was real and uh, and we did meet um he's as you might imagine him to be a very smart um uh, very geeky kind of guy uh he'd really read it and 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 asked an awful lot of questions and uh, we had a couple of hours of talking about uh, all of that and it was great fun um and, uh, and, and then they sent a film crew around to do that little video that was on his blog. So uh, they, they came around to UCL and spent two days filming it all for a one, one minute wow. video. <laughs> I did notice that a lot of it was filmed in, in different rooms and it was just one continuation of the same yes. sort of story. Of, of, I mean, I talked for research. about two days and they cut out everything. Wow. <laughs> wow that's fantastic that all always right, happens I, with any media organization they all they always overfilm massively and and you think oh i'm going to be i'm going to feature prominently in this and then they cut everything out until there's 20 seconds left or something you think ah, <laughs> how was i so bad that i i ended up uh, cut out <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm conscious that I, I didn't actually ask a, a single question about medical journalism, so I'm going to pass it back to Alexia for a, a few minutes, and then I'll ask those afterwards. Okay. Um, so go for it, Alexia. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Marty. Um, so yeah, now that we're talking a little bit about, about your books, um, so could you give us a rough guideline or maybe the process of how it is to be writing a scientific book? What would you give us a hint as a tip? Well, they've they've changed as I've been writing them. So I've just I'm just finishing one now, 
which has been the most difficult of all of them, um, in part because it's on the Krebs cycle, which is intrinsically hardcore biochemistry that's really difficult to sell as, as an idea to people, and actually really difficult to write about in a way which is entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, if I'd we like could go into your head and like see how you read, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. to see how you wrote such books and the book that you're writing now about the Krebs cycle, what would you, what would you say it was? I mean, you, you, you need initially an idea that will carry a book. Mm -hmm. And for, for this one on the Krebs cycle, I've, I've got two lines of work that I do in the lab. One is on the origin of life. And, and effectively, if you can get CO2 to react with hydrogen, what you get is Krebs cycle intermediate. So this is right at the core of our own biochemistry. Uh, and they form spontaneously right there in hydrothermal type conditions. And then at the other side of the spectrum, um, in, in cancer, in the last few years, it turns out that mutations in the enzymes in the Krebs cycle drive cancer. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a thing called the Warburg effect where, where cells effectively metabolically re reprogram and, and, and start fermenting and growing like, like yeast. Um, cancer cells grow that way very often. And it, it's turned out that that's all to do with the Krebs cycle as well. So you've got these two ends of a spectrum, the origin of life on one side, cancer on the other side. And I have ideas that fill in the middle as well. Um, and so there's there's a big scope there, in some sense, my usual scope, but with different things to say about it. So the first thing is, well, you need a proposal. It's not only the publishers who want a proposal. You've got to think, how am I going to fit this material together so that it, it, it works as a book? And, and I, you know, I, I wrote that four or five years ago, probably, that proposal mm -hmm. for this particular book that I'm finishing now. Yeah. Um, and I've not followed it very much at all. Uh, because they evolve, they take their own life, they go where they want to go. And then how do you actually, how do I write? Um, I, I write notes, I scribble, I think, I think through a storyline, I scribble more. I spend weeks or months thinking about the material and trying to get a coherent path through it, a storyline through it. Um, and then I start writing. And I ignore my storyline. Again, it takes its own path and it goes where it wants to go. But I, I, there's a vague, loose structure around it that because I've been with it for months and thinking about it and I want to bring this in or I want to bring that in, that, but I give it the freedom to go where it wants to go. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, imagine I edit. it wouldn't be really rough. I imagine it wouldn't be very structured writing a book. Is that correct? Um, it has to be structured. Oh, you said that you scribble and you make other notes and uh, you let the topic go. Yeah, I mean, but, but, the, but I'm scribbling notes of saying, I'm going to cover this material and it leads to this and it leads to that and it leads to this and this is what I'm going to write about here and that. And, and But when you come to actually physically put the words on the page, mm -hmm. you find it didn't work. Every time, you, it just doesn't work. Um, but you know roughly what you wanted to cover and maybe another way comes up or maybe you just go in a completely different direction to where you thought you were going to go. And you've still got to keep the structure in your mind. You've still got to link it up with the other chapters. You've still got to cover a certain amount of material. Uh, you've got to keep the book in your mind. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a very obsessive process. <laughs> um, it's really hard to let go. There's often, you know, I don't think of this as a day job, really. I, I should be in the lab or I should be teaching or, you know, I shouldn't be working on a book during a day, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's weekends and evenings and holidays. Mm -hmm. And some days I let myself work on the book as well, because in some sense it is part of my job. Mm -hmm. um, and then I can't stop. <laughs> I, I, I start in the morning I just can't put it aside and then I may, I may go on for weeks that way before I can manage to stop myself so it's, it's there's a level of kind of obsessive compulsive disorder about writing for me I can't help myself mm -hmm. okay so um thank you thank you for <laughs> guiding us through the outline um quick question uh we have an audience question from Elisa and she's mm. asking um, what is the most challenging aspect of scientific writing for you and how do you overcome it? I think, um, I think probably trying to work out who I'm writing for. 
mm. was was because that you know the tone that you adopt and you, you could adopt lots of different tones but but once you've found one you tend to stick with it whereas novelists or poets would find different tones and keep changing themselves but I, I think you know if you want to read a book by Richard Dawkins you kind of know what his tone is going to be and I think with science science books um, people expect you to write in a certain way and would be let down if you kind of changed it all around and did something very wacky and different so um so what is that tone? And, and that partly depends on well, who are you writing for? And then you realize, well, where are they reading it? Even if you know who you're writing for, which you never do, are, are, is someone reading it on the tube? Are they reading it in bed? Are they reading it in the bath? Are, are they on a bus? You know, where are they? What are they doing? Do you need to do a little summary every two pages because someone you know, reads a bit and then falls asleep and then goes back to it three days later? Can't remember what they read. Um, you, you, you know, you, 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 you can't answer any of those questions and you begin to lose your marbles worrying about it. Then I realized, which was probably the thing that I found most helpful in all of this, was really, I was writing for myself at the age of 16. So I didn't know much, but I had a real thirst to know things, to learn things, to understand the world, to... And I was reading books voraciously at that age and, and really affected by them. Um, they bothered me. I mentioned Dawkins. I mean, the selfish gene really troubled me when I was 16. And I, I, I read another book afterwards uh, that I could see was a much less good book um, by, by Stephen Rose, as it happened, which was entitled Not in Our Genes. And it was a kind of a counter argument to the selfish gene. And I was just relieved that someone could come up with a counter argument. Now I can see lots of counter arguments, but I didn't like the idea. Um, but that's actually really good science writing because it should be troubling. It, you know, these ideas are difficult and not, you know, humanly difficult, not necessarily difficult to understand but difficult to live with um there is a side to science which this is why there is a why why there can be an antipathy with religion because because science says the world is this way and religion may say the world is not this way it's that way uh, and, and we may or may not be able to reconcile those positions but you know they are serious positions for people and you 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 can't avoid them so that's another difficult thing about writing science is how do you find a tone where you don't offend or insult people because of their faith, for example? Mm -hmm. How do you find the right way of I, what I think is right, but I, it may not be right. You've got to find the right way of capturing as much truth as you can without being patronizing to people. And I, I suppose in the end, I just thought, well, I was, I was absorbing this stuff when I was 16. And I, I, I wanted someone to be patient enough with me to explain it. Uh, and then, and then tell me as it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's really what I try and do. All right. I understand. Um, so you mentioned tone is the one thing that someone must have on their mind when they're writing a book. Is it something that uh you wish you knew beforehand writing a book or if it's not what was the one thing that you wish you knew before you started um writing hmm um no i think i found out about tone along the way mm -hmm. um I, I mean, I have a tendency to overwrite and to 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 use too complicated words or to strive to be poetic, all of which is bad uh, for a science book, um, and, and to crack jokes, most of which are bad jokes, uh, which again is bad for a science book. You can allow yourself a few, and you have to learn to kind of take the edges off yourself so that you're not too much yourself. Otherwise, you become not palatable over 300 pages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so so you, you do construct yourself. Perhaps that is one of the things I've learned, uh, which is maybe most important. And I still don't really know how to do it. Um, <laughs> you I can don't, learn along the way. Yeah, I've written a lot, but I don't feel that I really know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> but I don't I mind that. that. <laughs> no, well, sci I find science the same. I, I don't really know what I'm doing in the lab. I don't, you know, but actually... I you learn to live with it because it's not just me it's really 
we really don't know about the origin of life. We can we can probe it. We can ask questions. We can, but but you know, different people think who know a lot about it. You 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 said, Mardi, did it start from outer space? Did it start in Darwin's warm pond, or did it start at the bottom of the oceans? The very fact that you can ask that question means we do not know. We do not agree with each other. We, we you know, we, <laughs> the simple one line answer is we don't know. Um, we have passionate ideas, deeply, strongly held ideas and theories and whatever else. And some of them may be true or maybe a mixture of them, which is true. But I, I think one of the nice things about writing books is you need to convey some, some of the excitement and the urgency of doing science and what science is about, but also some of the, the unknown, the fact that we don't know what the answers to these are and that science is really the quest to find the answers to, the, uh, to questions that we don't know what the answers are, that it's finding out about the world, not kind of revising for exams of stuff that we already know. Um, so I think for most people, science is much more exciting if you see it as exploration and learning to live with this uncertainty in everything that you do. You don't know if it's the right experiment. You don't know if you did the experiment well. You don't know if your hypothesis is a good hypothesis. You live with that all the time, day in, day out. And I think it's an important thing to try and convey in books as well. And I think people, I'd like to think people like that, that, that there's a kind of an honesty about how do we find out about the world? And, and then you can convey, you know, there are some amazingly brilliant people who come up with fantastic ways of seeing things and, in imagining things, inventing things, questioning things, and, and, and to convey some of that as well is a real pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is what science is to me, is, is, is this kind of ex exploration of the unknown uh, and living with uncertainty on a, on a daily basis, but it's exciting. Mm, yeah, that is really interesting. I think this is a very, um, very interesting like viewpoint to see how uh, science could emerge, um, I wanted to I wanted to ask just one more question. Um, so, what advice uh, would you give to someone that aspires to be a scientific researcher and a writer at the same time as yourself, but is afraid that the balance between the two might be lost? You said that sometimes you get carried away by writing a book all all day and um, yes. you don't focus on your lab work that much. Would you, do you have a solution to that or are you trying to find that along the way as well? Um, I think you can, I think you can find a longer term balance, which is to say, if you do obsessively write for a week or two, then you've got a couple of weeks worth of stuff that you better catch up with now. And you'll come with writing, you come to a point where you can't do it anymore. So you, you, you go and do something else. And, and then you've got to obsessively do that for a while and you put the writing away for a few weeks. So you can find a balance over months, but it's hard to find a balance in days. I find it very difficult to do two hours of writing in the morning and then the rest of the day do something else. But other people can do that. Um, it's just not me. Mm -hmm. So what would I advise? I think for me, one of the wonderful things about writing books is, uh, and trying to, trying to write for the general public or, or, or myself at 16, where where people want to understand and they don't want to be patronized, but they don't want to be um, talked down to. Um, mm -hmm. but, but also I think the excitement is at the edge of what we know. And so the challenge is to try and put quite complex ideas in, in as simple terms as you possibly can mm -hmm. so that they're, they're clear. Yeah. And it's, that's a very rewarding thing to try and do. And the, and the strange thing about writing books is you put things together so that they're clear. You put ideas in their most clear form together. And it's a, in a strange way, it's a little bit like writing a mathematical equation or something. You're, you're effectively defining terms, defining ideas with as much clarity as you can, and then putting them next to each other and see what happens. And mm -hmm. sometimes they don't fit and you realize that there's a problem here. And, and that's one of the that's another exciting thing. But this is a really important thing for science, not for writing books so much. But for if you've got really clear ideas and you realize that they don't fit together, you realize there's a hole here. There's a problem here. There's a you know there's a question mark in this place. What can I do about it? And so I th I, th I think the to to try to try and write for the general public has improved me enormously as a scientist. It's helped me find what the questions are. Mm -hmm. in a way that I don't think I could have done if I hadn't been writing books. And the other thing that it, it does, apart from help you find the questions, is it, it forces you to be honest. 
Um, now, I'm not suggesting people are dishonest, but there's a kind of, there's a responsibility that comes with writing a book. If people read it, and it's quite startling for me, you, I write a book, I don't expect anybody to read it, but then people read it. And you, you realize, well, I'm telling people what I think, but I, I have a responsibility to be it's, it's not just clear, but, but balanced, not to trash people that I don't like. Hmm. Just I don't like them. You know, that's not that's not allowable in my mind. That's not that's not fair. That's not science. That's dishonest. Uh, and and so there's a requirement that you must put yourself out of it and be as balanced and clear and fair as you possibly can. Hmm. And that's a really good perspective for coming into science questions as well, because it it's meant you've taken a step back and you've compared different people's ideas and you've done it as fairly as you possibly can. Um, and, and so now you have a sense of the lie of the landscape and then you ask the questions and you think, well, the answer has to lie here because I've, I've simplified this as much as I can. I've been as fair as I can. I've seen the lie of the landscape and I think the answer's here to the best of my ability. I think this is where the answer, so I'm going to do experiments on this. And, and that then is a very exciting thing as a scientist because it means that you have a, I mean, I feel as if I have a better chance of being right about it. <laughs> Okay. Because of that process of writing. <laughs> I understand. Okay, I'm just going to hand over to Marty for a bit to ask you yeah. a bit of questions on journalism. Great. Thank you, Alexia. I'm just conscious of time, so I'll ask one question and then we'll move over to the, the quick fire one. Okay. Um, but I, I guess that the you talked about honesty, dishonesty, you talked a lot about communication, and it really does percolate through that you are, I think, in essence, a communicator, whether it's through your books or as a lecturer or as an academic. And Another great communicator was uh, Richard Feynman, and uh, there's a quote of his that I, I like quite a lot, which is that if you um, if you couldn't explain it to your grandmother, um, you don't know it well enough. And you know, I think for for most of, I guess since we've had science, it's been rather straightforward that if you do know it well enough and you explain it and you have uh, qualifications to talk about it, people will believe you. But I find it kind of strange that we're in sort of now in an age where you can know it well enough, you can be an expert on it. And you can explain it to your grandmother, but she might not believe you. And well, you so know, funny enough, I, quote, I quoted that on the radio once, and I had an email, a very angry email from a grandmother who said, "How dare you insult grandmothers? What is what is the implication here that grandmothers are somehow less able to understand this than grandfathers <laughs> or or mothers or or, or children?" Uh, and she had a point. <laughs> yeah, I was very apologetic, no, I, po and I've, point I've never taken. quoted Feynman on that one since. But um, yes, I mean, I, I think, sorry, what would remind me what your question was? So the question was more to get your thoughts on this sort of age of fake news and misinformation that we find ourselves in. And COVID is such an yeah. interesting example of this, whether it's COVID deniers or anti-vaxxers, that despite all of this information that's readily available and disseminated by experts, by people who know, or who in theory know what they're talking about, people don't want to believe it or, or refuse to believe it. And as a communicator, I, I want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's troubling. Um, and it, it's, I, I don't think there's an easy fix to it because, I mean, what people see is an expert, a scientist saying one thing and then another expert scientist saying more or less the opposite. Uh, and it looks like we're squabbling. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think the public is quite right to think, do they know what they're talking about? Um, now, the thing is that science is a lot about squabbling. It's a lot about disagreements. It's a lot about competing, conflicting hypotheses and trying to find the truth. And I, I think in some sense, social media can bring the worst out in people. Um, so I tend not to, not to do social media for that reason, because I, I fear it will bring the worst out in me as well. So I <laughs> prefer not to. I think books can bring the best out in me. So I'll, I'll stick to that format. Um, I think a lot of people do care about the truth, but don't know how to um, separate between conflicting information from people that's coming, that, se that seem to be bona fide sources and they're contradicting each other. And I think the problem here really is how science is taught in schools, which is there's a curriculum and you've got to learn this stuff and you've got to learn that stuff. And it's really taught to you as if it's the truth. 
Um, this is the kind of the dogma of, of, of what we know about the world from the, the clergy of scientists. Uh, and it's, science is not like that. Science, as I was saying before, is about exploring the unknown. It's about how do you ask questions effectively? How can you begin to get at an answer by reformulating and re-asking and probing a question by changing something, by doing an experiment, whatever it may be? Um, and so, so this kind of uncertainty and clashing and arguments is part of the scientific method. And I wish it was taught in schools, but I don't think it is really taught in schools in that way. It's not really part of the curriculum. It's, and I think it would be more exciting for people, but it would also help people begin to say, okay, well, how do you look for flaws in an argument? How do you, how do you rigorously take apart this person's structure of their argument? Um, how do you think for yourself actually in the end? And that's what we're not teaching people. And so, you know, people who care will work it out for themselves. But a lot of people who don't have the time of day to worry about these things will just hear a lot of conflicting opinions and not have the time or the incentive, or the inclination to try and work it out for themselves. And, and that, I think, is our biggest failing as a society, because if you think, what are we going to do about global warming or what are we going to do about... Um, you know, Black Lives Matter or anything that you, you think is a problem. And, you, and it goes back to school. It goes back to education. How are we going to change people's attitudes, their views of life? And, and the only answer is, you know, people have to, to, to be taught to think rationally and well. And the curriculum is almost irrelevant to a lot of that. So I don't know what we do, but I, I think we, we can only do so much as individuals. And we can try and encourage each other. And, you know, you doing this now is, is part of it. Uh, me writing books is, is part of it. I, I think it's just, a, you know, a sincere attempt to communicate with people and to talk about how things are and how we understand the world and do it as well as we can. The hope is that it will influence some people, that it will change, begin to change the way that people think or what they care about. And, and if enough people, and I, I feel this is happening, especially with, well, with, with a lot of big things that matter in the world at the moment. I, I feel as if there's a tide of a, a change in, in, in the weight of opinion, which is shifting the world potentially to a better place. But there's still enough anger and resentment about it that we can easily tip back to a worse place and and uh, i think you know we're in some kind of titanic battle at the moment and it's for the world and the only way that <laughs> goodness and light can win that battle is if we are able to help people to think by teaching better in schools yeah thank you that's such a great answer um, thank you very much i'll i guess i'll pass over to alexi now for the first couple of quick fire questions and then we will uh, we'll wrap up. Okay. Yeah, so we have um, some small questions about uh, you mostly. So my first one is, what is your go-to lockdown activity? Uh, w walking. <laughs> yeah, walking. <laughs> That's pretty sad, isn't it? <laughs> I thought um, you were going to say writing. <laughs> um, well, I would like to be able to say that as well, but it's been walking, actually, uh, <laughs> just getting out and... and um, Yes, write, writing I, I've done a lot, but I've done, you know, it's been an awful, it's been hard on with teaching and things as well. The writing is, has been fitted into small gaps. Yeah. Uh, so, so really the, the place where I've managed to get a breath of fresh air and think, mm -hmm. maybe that's, that's what's walking helps me think. Yeah. So that's been my go-to activity. Helps me rebalance. Mm -hmm. I understand. I do too, actually. Um, so who is the scientist that you most admire? That's a really tough one. Um, and there's quite a few who I admire. I mean, but I admire for certain aspects of their personality rather than all of it. Um, if you could pick one. I actually, it's, it's, I would probably say Darwin. Darwin. Not because he's an obvious person. There's lots of people I could pick who would be less known. But I think... Especially, you know, there's been a lot of, we've had this, uh, we've had an inquiry into eugenics at UCL over the last year or two, um, because a lot of the pioneering geneticists who are great names in population genetics were at UCL and they were basically eugenicists. They were a nasty bunch of people, brilliant minds, nasty people. Um, 
And, and, and this is something you have to live with as a scientist, that people who you admire for their science, or you would not admire for their humanity. So what do you do? Do you, do you strip you know, lecture theatres of their names? Well, we have done. And I think, you know, I've changed my mind on that. I didn't think we should be stripping names from lecture theatres, but I think actually it, it is the right thing to do now. I say this because the people I admire, I admire certain aspects of their science and not necessarily them as people. And the reason I say Darwin then is because I think he was a, a good man. He was a, someone who thought hard and deep about everything he did and cared about people and cared about science and was honest. Mm -hmm. So I, I think he, he was beyond a great scientist. He was also a, a, a human being to respect. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, and um, if you could recommend a book other than your own for <laughs> everyone to read. I'm not sure I could recommend my own. <laughs> <laughs> I, if you, I mean, I'm sure you would, but something else, another book. Mm. You're thinking your own. No, no, I'm not actually. Um, I mean, I, I, I mentioned the selfish gene before and how that affected me at the age of 16. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, it's not my favorite book by any means, but I, I think it's a book that uh, changes the way people think about the world, mm -hmm. even if you disagree with it. And yeah. I think that's, that's a great achievement for any book is that it can make you think in a way which is different to how you did think, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with that book. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's a science book. When you say a, a book, I tend to think of science books. I used to read an awful lot of novels. Um, I don't read very many novels anymore. But if you pull up now from 20 years ago when I was reading a lot of novels, the one that comes immediately to mind for some reason would be Solzhenitsyn. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the First Circle was one, one book that immediately springs out in my memory as being something which, again, had a wonderful humanity to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, Marty? Hmm. Thank you. Um, so you, you mentioned paleontology right at the yes. start. Uh, and I remember hearing that you used to take your kids um, searching for fossils. So my question to you is, what is the most interesting fossil you've ever found? <laughs> um ammonites probably i have found ammonites occasionally um uh, i never i mean whenever i find an ammonite it's always cemented firmly into the rock and i can never just take it home um so the, the most exciting one that i've actually found that i could take home i did find a bit of a trilobite on, on more than one occasion but i'm a very very bad fossil hunter and i normally just find devil's toenails and things like that <laughs> <laughs> um number so an ultimate question is, what would it surprise people to know about you? Uh, well, the thing that seems to surprise people most is uh, that I play the fiddle in pubs. Um, <laughs> well, you stole my next question, so I, let's, I, let's, I, go I, let's go with that. Let's hear about that. I don't know why that surprises people so much. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but maybe what, uh, what surprises me most um, I, you know, I spent years playing the fiddle in pubs and then had kids and really kind of only occasionally play now, but, um, but my kids now play and they got to the point where Brilliant. the older one uh, is older now, he's 16, um, and he's good enough to play in pubs. So I'm now under pressure to go back to playing <laughs> the fiddle in pubs. And I, I can't think of a better way of doing it than with your own, with your own son, really. So <laughs> then let me, if, if you, if, if I may amend the question and ask yes. what, is your favorite song to play on the fiddle? Uh, song is probably the wrong word because I can't sing at all. Tune. I just, I just Let's play go with tunes. tune. Yes, I play Irish music. I, I, so Lovely. Jigs and reels and so on. Um, uh, it would be hard to give you an answer because you wouldn't, if I, if I said farewell to Erin or something, you'd have no idea what I was talking about. Um, so, I can give it a Google afterwards. <laughs> Well, that would be definitely one of them, but it, it's more the form of music that I love and, and, and the fact that it happens in pubs, the fact that it brings happiness to, to, to me, but to other people's lives around because it's very spontaneous. It's, it's not difficult music. It's not difficult to play compared to classical music or klezmer or jazz or something. It's, it's, it's quite easy, but it sounds difficult and it brings a lot of joy to people. Um, and and uh, that's 
I have treasured memories of, of um, evenings where I, I feel like I brought a bit of happiness into not just my own life, but other people's lives. And that's a treasured memory. Fantastic. And then the very last question uh, for tonight. Uh, I am having a dinner party uh, in a few weeks when the uh, when COVID restrictions ease and uh, you are all invited. And you get yeah. to bring three guests that can be any figure from any field in any time in history with no language barriers or anything like that that would uh, might prevent you from picking them. So question is simple. Who would you bring? <laughs> um well, the people who I, people who I really wish I'd met, um, among them. So, I mean, John Maynard Smith would be one of them, uh, who you probably all know because he was, he was there, wasn't he? Yes, we have we have yeah. had many lectures in the JMS uh, lectures. Have you? Labs. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I never I never met him, but I'm told that he used to go to the pub and sit sit around in the circle of students, and everyone would talk, and uh, it would be you know he he sounded like one of the cleverest, most approachable people who you could wish to meet, um, and I regret that I never met him. So he would be one person because I would love to spend an evening talking with him. Uh, Lynn Margulis would be another one. Um, Interesting. She, the younger Lynn Margulis, she died of a stroke. And I, I have a feeling, but don't know, that she may, have, it may not have been the first stroke. I have a feeling that towards the end, she got vascular dementia and was beginning to lose, lose her marbles a little bit. I have no idea. That may be not, not fair or kind, but... Um, but when she was younger, she was revolutionary. And I would love to have known her at the period where she was turning the field of evolutionary biology on its head. I did meet her towards okay. the end of her life and that was a little disappointing because she was stuck in a rut by that time, but I don't think she would have been earlier on. So that's two right. people. Who am I going to go for the yeah. third one? I mean, um, Am I going to stay another scientist and give you an honest, truthful answer? Because these are the people who I really would like to meet. <laughs> I say Jesus. Or Honestly, something. whoever. It's, it's completely um, up to you. Anyone you want. Um, you know, I, I live science so much, it would be another scientist. But I, I think actually Feynman would be, would be someone who I would have loved to have met. I, I'm not sure I'd understand a word that he said, but uh, <laughs> it would be nice trying to find out. I mean, again, because he was such a brilliant communicator as well and an inspirational figure, uh, Richard Feynman, I, I would love to have met him. Nick Lane, thank you so much uh, for joining us for this event. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you to all of you in the audience uh, that have been watching. Um, thank you to the Biochemistry Society for co-hosting this event. And of course, to my co-host, uh, Alexia. Well, uh, I actually read... I actually read uh, Nick's books when I was 16 and uh, I couldn't recommend them highly enough to all of you in the audience who are watching. Um, so I, and I very much hope you enjoyed our conversation with Nick. I certainly did. Uh, the year is coming to an end as are our, our events and our time on the committee. We've got one more uh, in a couple of weeks with uh, we've done UCL with Nick. We're going over to KCL, King's College, <laughs> uh, with the psychologist and geneticist uh, Robert Plowman uh, to talk about uh, all things nature versus nurture so please do join us for that and we'll have elections coming up as well so uh, do give our facebook page a like to find out more about that but for now it's goodbye for me and uh, i wish you all uh, a lovely weekend thank you